Good evening, everyone. I'm very, 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 very sorry. Many of you recognize me. I've been traveling all over the Philippines. I forgot your names, but I know your faces. So I'm glad that we're all reconnected here in the U.S. We'll be talking about, uh, while we had the national situation from Marvin, uh, and he gave us the situation as they are, the concrete uh, events and statistics. But Levy told me, food for thought, for community action, for organizing, mixing theory with practice. So this is an effort uh, in that direction. Some items I put here are, let's first look at the problems with which we are confronted here and in the good old country. And then what are the different ways by which we can look at uh, the human rights situation? And what are some terms? I'll just gloss over them, but they'll be up there. Levy will give you uh, a link, or maybe phase two when the book will be published. And then the possible uh, responses for uh, this. <coughs> okay, so some problems uh, in three words uh, for domination, oppression, and then there's resistance, three aspects. And human rights don't just come from nowhere. They're not just ideas, rather there was first the social reality. Wherever there's oppression, people will fight for their rights. And as Levy put it very nicely, it's uh, God's gift to humanity and humanity's gift to itself. Okay, so this is what people did for so many years, decades, and centuries. Howard Zinn, you'll see his face here very often, he, he mentioned the Philippines in his writings. I don't know why we don't read his books like breathing fresh air. We should. Uh, he mentioned like the history of military occupation in third world countries brings neither democracy nor security. And same in the Philippine case, when foreign uh, hegemony was uh, fully in control, now there was a war, and what had, what it led to a dictatorship. <coughs> so first idea. And since that Mark Twain talked about the Philippines and said that, well, why is a big foreign hegemony country in the Philippines? For some reason. And Zin said it's the mindset that makes it what it is. And uh, this happened not only in the Philippines, in Cuba, in many parts of the world. And one problem that Zin is saying today is that, well, there's a very nice piece of document called the Declaration of Independence. But what's really being employed is Machiavellian uh, foreign policy. Too bad. And these are the people with whom mm -hmm. I go on vigils every Friday uh, around the corner in DeKal. This is a photo from the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, she's 89 years old. She'll be 90 December 6th. And her husband passed away, a physicist, with a peace now signed in blue. And more often than not, it's people my age and older who are in that corner. It's so hard to bring the youth in. We need second liners. If we're gone, what's going to happen? This is one lesson. Uh, we try all kinds of music, traditional music, pop music, hip hop, everything, name it. Uh, we could bring in people at certain points in time, but when there's an issue around which students can gather, uh, we could be successful. So if we're only us forever until we crow, what's going to happen? We need to recruit fresh blood. Now, Cornel West, this was in Occupy. I know there's a big Occupy here. Well, I was watching it on TV and I have no chance to see that place and I know it's just a plaza <laughs> now, empty. If only war on poverty was a real war, then we would actually be putting money into it. Wow, <laughs> yeah. something to think of. That's a little zen moment, that not the right vocabulary for this group. Now, when there was a movie that came out, not by a, is it Coptic Christian? from Egypt who lives in California, is it? 
did we write a statement about this? Or do we just see it come and go on TV? And goodbye. Another action. Did we show uh, our position on this situation? Don't say it's too hard. You can always write a letter to the editor. And there are even online versions. No excuses. But well, we did do a statement. Oh, you did? Well, well, you're way up there. <laughs> I'm talking about ordinary people, as Howard Zinn says. But thank you. Good for doing that. Well, we always talk of middle class. <coughs> newspaper on TV, political ads. Who are really the middle class? They're the working people. And we're kind of crushing the working people. In some countries, statistically, you can even say there's a middle class. Well, units of analysis, when we talk about rights, there are different levels. Some people will just focus on the people. Others would say, well, we're just human animals. There are also non-human animals. We're just animals. And others would say, what about the context uh, in which we live? We have to look at that. And the people who, with whom we have political relations. And then there are also people nowadays, corporations. So we have to look at these different, well, maybe you don't agree, neither do I, but some treat them as corporations. Significance, we have to get local knowledge, and move things to action, and then the people will be the ones doing social change. But we, not the middle sector, will be the catalyst for social change. And uh, that's where the localization comes in. Well, with all of the oppression and domination, we have rebel groups, right? Peace talks, peace agreement, yeah. We had hundreds of them, don't we? Yeah, so don't be too positive. Maybe cautiously optimistic, we'll be fine. And then they command some rebel forces. And then you have peace talks, but it's just a framework. Instead of calling the place Autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, they call it Bangsamoro. It's a big change. Recognizing mm -hmm. the uh, entity as a people, the Moro people, Bangsamoro. But don't think things will change overnight. I don't think so. Now, what are the different ways by which we can look at the world? The old days, everything is universal. And we have the great sages, mostly men, dead and white. And then times have changed. We still have the scientific view. And we talk about <coughs> man. That's when people say, wait a minute. You all talk of universality. You talk of men. What about the others? Like women, indigenous people, LGBT, hair, all the differences in the world. So more inclusive. So as we go along in time, ideas have changed. Now, things change. Nothing is permanent. And sometimes we keep the status quo as it is. Very often, some mixture of reform and status quo. And at certain points in time, French Revolution, English Revolution, American Revolution, Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution, and Philippine Revolution happen too. So I'm not saying one is better than the other. That's history says we go through different <coughs> types of social change. Now, I would say, well, it's too hard. We're fighting a big behemoth. We're living you know, under the belly of the beast. That's called structure. It's hard to change. But I would say, no. Even if I am one, I can do something. That's agency. We, we live with one and the other. We work with both. So when we do action, we say, yeah, true. The Supreme Court gave a decision. However, it doesn't mean it's permanent. Remember, Clizzy versus Ferguson, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, things, things change, and they still change. And Levy made some allusions to this. When we look at society, oftentimes we just have very limited lens. We just talk of, well, I'm a trained theologian. I can only talk of ethics and philosophy. Oh, I'm only trained in microeconomics. But Levy and I are saying, no, 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 no. Go out of your very 
a very limited lens, look at the bigger picture. Okay, so you have to look at economic, political, and cultural phenomena and how they live. Now, there are four ways by which we can also study uh, human rights and look at how we deal